So first of all, the context of my lecture, uh, we're an outpatient imaging center-based radiology practice. Uh, we do community-based research, uh, MRI-based prostate cancer detection and therapy program. Uh, the first tier is multiparametric MRI based uh, at 1.5T with no endorectal coil. We use the Invivo DynaCAD solution for CAD. We use the uh, Invivo DynaTrim solution for MR-guided inbore biopsy. And then the Visual A system that's made its way over into uh, Medtronic for outpatient MR-guided transrectal uh, laser focal therapy. So this is kind of the context uh, in which I'll be talking about radiogenomics. And these are the pertinent um, uh, clinical trials. So the title has both current and emerging. Um, for current, you know, if you look at the NCCN guidelines, it's interesting that back in 2016, you can see that multiparametric MRI actually made a little appearance here um, on the guidelines for a, a fairly short period of time in the, in the pathway for an elevated serum PSA. Then it disappeared for about three years and then reappeared again uh, for patients with an elevated serum PSA. Um, to consider uh, a multiparametric MRI uh, prior to going on to biopsy, either trust biopsy or trust biopsy with a targeted biopsy or follow-up imaging in this um, particular clinical pathway. In terms of the biomarkers and the genomics component of things in, in the 2019 NCCN guidelines, it turns out, in, especially in the setting of a biopsy, whether there's atypia, high-grade PIN, or a benign biopsy to consider the use of biomarkers in this setting. And also it's included in the pathway for consideration prior to biopsy. As most of us know, there's, there's kind of a, a pretty big menu of these different biomarkers that are included in many of these guidelines, which at some level makes it a little bit confusing in terms of, you know, which ones to use in, uh, appropriately in the utilization. Now, having said that, based on those guidelines, there's clearly a lot that's happened in the last year or two. I'm assuming did a very nice job of reviewing some of the uh, level one studies, uh, level one B promise trial, the precision level one, some level one slash two, the 4M, the MRI first trial. And uh, these are all uh, multi-institutional clinical trials. Um, some of them randomized controlled trials um, in biopsy naive men that show the advantages of multiparametric MRI uh, compared to trust biopsy. So, you know, we have, you know, very few biomarkers or other diagnostic tests for detecting prostate cancer that has um, this level of evidence in place. So clearly, um, this is gonna have an impact on guidelines. Um, and we've seen that already. Uh, this has been talked about here at this meeting. The EAU's uh, 2019 guideline has been widened uh, with MRI uh, recommended uh, in biopsy naive men. So we know there are problems with MRI. Everybody's pretty aware of that. So we need a safety net. The safety net is evolving. Um, for us, we use the PSA density as a safety net. So even if the MRI is negative, we'll go on to make sure that those patients have a systematic biopsy in those biopsy naive men, even though the MRI is negative to make sure we don't miss clinically significant disease that's MRI occult. We also use MRI-based active surveillance, especially in our focal therapy program. We think that this is key. And any patients that have evidence of MRI progression, whether the ADC is going down, the lesions enlarging or has recurred, this is an indication in, in our focal therapy program for targeted biopsy. So, the other part of the title is, you know, emerging role. What's the emerging role here? And this is in the context of our focal therapy program that I'm going to discuss some of the emerging roles for uh, the genomics component and how this is combined with imaging. Um, what I'm going to share with you is almost 10 year results um, in a phase two trial, and this is outpatient um, transrectal MR guided laser focal therapy. Um, this is the clinical trial number. Um, we've had a total of almost 160 patients. There's two limbs. There's a treatment naive limb, which is what we're going to summarize in this lecture. And then there's also a salvage limb, total of almost 250 lesions. So somewhere we've treated multiple lesions or some patients where we've retreated um, uh, uh, in field recurrences. You can see what the mean uh, initial PSA is and uh, age range. 
All of the patients get a biopsy um, at the treatment site. You see here at six months, and they also get follow-up multiparametric MRI at six months a year, and then yearly as part of the MRI-based active surveillance. Not surprisingly, this is a breakdown uh, by uh, zonal location in the treatment naive patients. And then also, these are predominantly intermediate risk, organ confined, prostate cancers, so T2A, T2B, T2C, clinical staging. Um, most of the um, patients, 53% of them are three plus fours, grade group two, 20% of them grade group three, and about a third of them are grade group one but those are generally large volume grade group ones, so about 1.3 to 1.5 centimeters in diameter at least or larger. If we look at what happens with the PSA in these patients at 12 months, there's a 34% decrease because we do true focal therapy. The goal is removal of the MRI abnormality plus a 1CM margin around it. So we see, uh, like I said, a 34% decrease at one year. When you look at the IPSS and the SHIM scores, the functional outcomes are very, very good. At one year, we don't see any statistically significant um, uh, development of incontinence or erectile dysfunction in these patients. We do see a little dip in the SHIM score, which actually claws its way back by about 12 months. And this is generally in the prostate cancers that are posterolateral, so it's kind of the five o'clock or seven o'clock position where the nerve may get stunned but generally it will claw its way back by 12 months. It's an interesting slide because we're biopsying all of these patients at the treatment site, you get a feel for what both the in-field and out-of-field marginal rec or recurrences look like. So for clinically significant prostate cancer, we define that as anything that has pattern four disease in it. So three cores or four cores at the treatment site, 19% clinically significant marginal recurrence, and then the out of field or incidence cancers that are in a different location, about 3%. So a total of about 22%. And you might say, well, that sounds like a pretty big number, but remember this is nine and a half years of follow-up we have, which includes you know, both the in field and out of field follow-up for cancers. And at five years you know, for intermediate risk prostate cancer, that number is probably about 20% for radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy it's about 30% even at 10 years. So these numbers aren't that far off, and, and these patients, most of them elect to have retreatment with laser. At nine and a half years, we've only had one case of metastatic disease, so the metastasis-free survival is 99%, and uh, we've had no cancer-specific uh, deaths, so cancer-specific survival is 100%. We've had a couple of patients that have passed away from other malignancies, especially um, from melanoma. So what are the problems we're dealing with and where's the opportunity for the genomics component of things? We really think it has to do with risk stratification. The problems are pretty clear. We're still trying to improve this marginal in-field recurrence rate. What can be done about detecting cancers that are out of field, so incidence cancers? Um, in our series, about 6% of the patients we've had to move over to whole gland therapy because they no longer meet the inclusion criteria for the trial. They get upgraded or the incidence cancer is a higher Gleason score. Rate of metastatic disease currently 0.8%. Um, with just the initial treatment, our short-term and intermediate oncologic control is 72% with really outstanding functional outcomes. Most of these patients, if they have a marginal recurrence that's treatable with laser, they elect to get a repeat laser. So it's kind of like getting a haircut kind of a thing where their intermediate risk prostate cancer potentially could be converted into a chronic illness that's treated with repeat laser. So these are some potential solutions for dealing with some of these problems. I'm just gonna focus in terms of the radiogenomics component of this with what can be done for risk stratification potentially. So we're using tissue-based genomics, also um, some liquid biopsy type solutions that we've just embarked on for risk stratification in patients potentially for focal therapy. Now one obvious biomarker that's gotten a lot of good attention and starting to get some presence in the publications is the value of the PSA density. If we look at in-field clinically significant recurrences, so marginal recurrences, notice that the PSA density initially is relatively higher compared to the clinically insignificant and the negative, and these are biopsies at the treatment site. 
So these are, respond, these are non responders here, clinically significant disease at six month biopsy. PSA density, the mean is 0.22. If the margins are positive at six months with clinically insignificant prostate cancer, so no pattern four disease, the mean PSA density initially is 0.17. And in those that have a biopsy that is um, negative at the treatment site and the follow up MRI at one year is negative, the mean PSA density is 0.15. So that may end up being useful, the initial PSA density for risk stratification. We'll see. And this is getting some attention um, in the literature. Another area we're looking at for risk stratification is tissue-based genomics. So initially, it was just based on uh, uh, P10 and ERG with Prostavision. We've shifted over to uh, the Genome DX product, uh, the Decipher for biopsy, and then also use the research-only um, uh, tool, the Decipher Grid. Um, one of the things that's emerged is that we know now with the genomics component of this disease that prostate cancer being, you know, very heterogeneous from a histologic standpoint, we now know that from a genomic standpoint, it's also very heterogeneous. And that determining the target accurately, meaning, for example, the target within a target using MRI and the ADC map, not just to biopsy the lesion, but to biopsy the most aggressive part of the lesion. So we look for the area with the most restricted diffusion. It may turn out that this is also important not only to find the highest um, grade disease histologically, but also possibly to find the most aggressive components from a genomic standpoint. When we look at our Decipher scores versus the um, Gleason score in our focal therapy patients, not surprisingly, there's a trend up in the Decipher score towards higher genomic risk going from grade group one to grade group two to grade group three. Um, we're in the process, actually, we've got enough numbers now that we're analyzing this to see what the relationship is, if any, between the decipher score and responders versus non-responders for focal therapy. The decipher grid is a research-only tool, tests for the entire human exome based on some RNA expression testing and has a cloud-based server for hosting um, the um, uh, registry type data. What we've done here actually, uh, uh, Bernadette Greenwood, our chief research officer, had a really great idea to, to actually go back and use this tool and assess responders and compare those responders with non-responders. So the non-responders are this dark green bar for focal therapy. So these are patients whose biopsy was positive at six months, either in field or out of field with clinically significant disease or their MRI became negative and their biopsy positive at two years. So non-responders here, here are the responders where the biopsy was negative and the MRI is negative. These are 20 genes that are either upregulated or downregulated. And you can see on this heat map that the upregulated genes are almost, you know, in an opposite pattern for these 20 genes that are upregulated and also an opposite pattern for these 20 genes that are downregulated when you compare responders versus non-responders. So this is a paired cohort. It's not statistically significant yet. Um, we're continuing to add uh, patients to this, but basically what we did is take these non-responders and then match them with patients that had similar Gleason score, similar zonal location, and similar clinical stage for their prostate cancer to see you know, what's going on in the human exome and develop a heat map that's actually very interesting, I think, for further study. Other thing we've embarked on uh, just in the last few months is liquid biopsy type risk stratification. So just a very small number of patients uh, at this point, only four cases where we've done this prospectively prior to their uh, MR guided laser focal therapy. But I want to share with you just, you know, the, the interesting opportunity that's here, even just in this small number of patients. First of all, in three quarters of the patients, um, circulating tumor cells were detected. Okay, and we all know that, you know, there's no circulating tumor cells that are ever found in a cancer-free individual. Okay, so it's an important observation. But look at this particular patient. On their six-month biopsy following treatment for clinically significant prostate cancer, the biopsy at the treatment site was benign and the uh, multiparametric MRI was negative for any other tumor suspicious regions. Also, look how low the PSA density here is. Very, very favorable PSA density. And yet, this patient has 
circulating tumor cells in their blood. Okay, what does that mean, right? If you're basing a focal therapy program on multiparametric MRI and, and histology and biopsy of treatment sites, and all of that can look super favorable, and yet you still have circulating tumor cells running around, what does that mean? And, and what's the potential also for using something like this maybe to help determine a, a definition of biochemical recurrence in patients who have focal therapy? So in summary with radiogenomics, a lot of what I presented hopefully is provocative by using the model of focal therapy. Uh, Multiparametric MRI we think followed by tissue-based genomics and also now uh, incorporating liquid, uh, liquid biopsy, we do think shows promise for risk stratification for patients that are considering focal therapy. Um, the research of radiogenomics in the setting of focal therapy may help to develop also combination therapies. So remember that that heat map I showed you, it may be that some of those genes that are upregulated and downregulated, that this may be useful in determining therapy using checkpoint inhibitors combined with um, focal therapy. So this is kind of a nice quote from uh, Hippocrates that I think is germane to the radiogenomics thing. It's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know uh, what sort of disease a person has. So I'd just like to finish up by acknowledging uh, our, our research team, which, which is a multidisciplinary team. As a, as a radiologist, it's been particularly important to bring a, a urologist uh, full-time into our, radio, our uh, research trials. Thank you very much for your attention.